the the thing that has hit me, Joel, is that I used to think that if you had enough people on board with something, then that would get the job done. But now I'm realizing that our government is increasingly detached from what it is that we all want. Uh, and I, I've been digging into some of the structural reasons why that is. So part of it is this 21% uh, satisfaction rate, 94% re-election rate. And you're like, well, that, that's a pretty big divide. Like if, if I was... Uh, let's say running a company, I'd be like, hmm, this might not be introducing the feedback <laughs> that, 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 I'm, that I'm looking for. Uh, uh, but it, it, because our government, like you said, people just have just thought, okay, this is the way it is. So it shall, so it was, so it ever shall be. Uh, and so now, now for me, it really is about the systems. It's like, okay, how, how do our elected representatives get elected? How do they keep getting reelected? What are their incentives? How does the leadership work? This is the this is a gridlock that's happened over and over on a thousand different things. Uh, and I mean, obviously going back a few administrations and where they just were like, we're just not going to do anything. We're just not going to help you at all. How what's the salute? How would you change that system so that would stop? All right. Here are a few big things that we need to do. Number one is public campaign financing so that if you run and you get a certain number of signatures, you get some public money enough to be competitive. Uh, my proposal during the campaign was a hundred democracy dollars for every voter you can give to any candidate you want. And so then if I got 10,000 people behind me, I get a million bucks and that's enough for me to, to compete and run, wash out some of the corporate money. Uh, because right now just the companies are bombing hundreds of millions of dollars into various campaigns. So that's, so that's big domino. Number one, number two is, uh, open primaries in, in place of these party primaries and trying to make the districts more competitive. So right now, over 80% of the congressional districts are either clean Republican or clean Democrat. In other words, there's no, there's no uncertainty as to who's going to win the general election. And so if you're a member of Congress in one of these safe seats, then you don't care about compromising with the other side. You just care about not getting primaried by someone in your own party, typically someone much more extreme. And so that ends up distorting your legislative incentives because it's like, well, I'd rather just seem like I'm like very, very strong on this side. And if nothing gets done, like I'm safe. But if I were to reach across the aisle and compromise and do something that some people are unhappy with, that's actually very bad for me in terms of my reelection prospects. That, that's the current set of incentives that they have. Um, so if you had open primaries instead of the closed primary system, then you'd have to reach out to more people in your district and not just satisfy um, the, the folks in your party. The big change in, in this direction that would be huge is ranked choice voting, because then if you have a number of people uh, in the district and it's open and ranked choice voting, then uh, makes it so that no one's worried about wasting their vote. For number one, because right now it's like, oh, you can't vote for that person. You're going to end up costing us this election. If you have ranked choice voting, you can vote for whoever the heck you want and then trust that uh, your your vote's going to end up um, counted in the best way possible. Uh, and it also diminishes the incentives to campaign negatively, because if you are if let's say there are five of you in the field and I trash candidate number two, then that person looks bad, I look bad, and then candidate number three is going to come up and beat us both. <laughs> so in right choice voting elections, everyone plays it more above board uh, because when you start throwing rocks at people, like, you know, you look bad and the person you're throwing rocks at looks bad. So so these would be the, the biggest changes you could make. But the, the change that I think has been rattling around for a long time that I am totally for that would change this um, maybe the most dramatically is just term limits for members of Congress. Uh, where if you have a, a term, it's a little bit like term 18-year uh, terms for Supreme Court justices, um, but we're making almost the equivalent of lifetime appointments in Congress right now, where you have dozens of members of Congress who've been there for 30 or 40 years, uh, you know, like, and, and you can see it too in the age of our leadership, where not to knock, you know, because there, there are a lot of like awesome um, people of any generation, any stage, um, but we have the equivalent of a gerontocracy right now, which is one right. reason why things feel the way that they do. I mean, the average age of a U.S. senator, I believe, is 62. If you look at leadership, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, Mitch McConnell are all in their 70s or even 80s, I believe, in one case. 
so y y we, we have a system that is rewarding seniority to the nth degree in Congress and nothing ever changes. Um, so I would have term limits for members of Congress. Uh, the, and what's wild, Joel, is when I looked into this, it turns out the vast majority of Americans intuitively agree with with term limits. Uh, like it has something like a 78 or 80% approval rating. So think about that for a second. Like what can you get 80% of Americans to agree on? Like not a whole lot, but you can get them to agree the on the fact that- Good, that's something they would all agree on. I like chocolate. And then yeah, that would be about 80%. It, yeah, it's like I like chocolate, and if I send someone to DC, they should eventually come back. <laughs> like, no. That's like about the only two things I can agree on. How do you get them to vote on something that would limit them? That's literally so counterintuitive. Well, my my big uh, proposal, Joel, is term limits for members of Congress, but current uh, current members are exempt or grandfathered in. So if you're a current legislator, you might get on board with this because you're like, well, like doesn't affect me. <laughs> and, uh, and it turns out Strom Thurmond was actually still alive and he was like, it's fine with me. I'm 125 now. And yeah. How long did he last? He was like there when he was 94, something like that. Yeah, he, he got up there. Uh, so those are some of the big structural fixes. Uh, if there's something that I'm excited about right now that's sweeping the nation, it is um, ranked choice voting because some states are voting on it right now. Um, I think Massachusetts is going to pass it. Maine already has it. Um, I think Seattle and New York City have it too, not statewide, but um, but in the cities. So when voters find out about ranked choice voting, they, they love it. They get excited because everyone realizes it's just a better expression of preference and it's a better democracy. It's just a higher functioning democracy if you can just say, look, I like this person first, this person second. This person third, and then after that, I refuse to even express a preference because I hate everyone else. Like that's fine, you know. So, like that, that would that would work. That would have worked wonders um, over the last number of uh, presidential cycles too. To be honest with you, because if you look at what was going on in the Republican primary in 2016, uh, Trump was Trump won those primaries, but he wasn't getting 50 percent in a lot of the places. You know, there, there were a lot of places early on where it's like Trump with with his crowd, but then there were, you know, whatever, six or seven other candidates and they were splitting up the rest. If you had ranked choice voting, it might be that someone else would have emerged on top. Yeah, no, I don't. It, and it's one of those things when you say it, you're like, yeah, why isn't it? It seems so. It's such a it seems so logical. It seems like, yeah, well, that's that seems like such a well, that's what you do if you, you if you're in a boat. You need an or because that makes you move like, right. That seems perfectly reasonable. And, and it doesn't seem that complicated at all. Well, yeah, it's not. When people find out about ranked choice voting, um, it ends up winning everything because everyone looks at it and is like, well, that just seems better. That's more logical. Like, we should just do that. Uh, and right now, the, the only resistance is from, frankly, uh, folks who are currently in power who like the 94% re-election rate, who are like, oh, no, like this is going to complicate Love my it. life. <laughs> like, I've, I've got my million-dollar moat all set up. I could just, like, yeah. I could just crouch here forever in the current system. Um, so, uh, but the average voter loves it. And if we can get that done, for anyone who wants a more vibrant democracy or is thinking that there's a need for a third party in the United States of America or other major parties because the current two-party system might not be uh, humming, uh, then you should just get behind ranked choice voting because the great thing about it is it's nonpartisan, bipartisan. It's like, look, it's just better process, better democracy. But it ends up enabling a more dynamic uh, third-party candidates as well because then the third-party candidate can show up and be like, don't worry, you're not going to help that person you hate get elected or like you're not going to be wasting your vote and you can still vote for me. <laughs> and, and like people, because right now that that argument actually is very, very powerful on people. It's like no one wants to help, um, you know, the person they like the least get elected. Massachusetts, Seattle, New York have it. Uh, Massachusetts is voting on it right now. Um, Maine has it. Uh, and then New York and Seattle, I believe, just recently adopted it or are voting on it. Right. Yeah, and they got to get rid of you know the the college you know the uh, what do you call it the uh, electoral college. Yeah, that is. I, I st and I, I know this is why I feel right about this is because even when I was six years old and they were explaining government to me and I was just like, what? I'm so confused. Why is it called a college? A. B. Uh, what is the point of it? 
And I couldn't, I still to this day are like, so we, and, and it doesn't make any sense at all. And I get that it has benefited both parties. It has benefited the Republican party most recently uh, with like Bush, Gore, and obviously Trump, uh, Clinton, but it's benefited the Democrats at some point. Uh, but I still, to this day, it's just like the popular vote seems as simple Occam's razor. That is the straightest thing line to electing the most popular person. So here's my proposal for the electoral college reform that I think would make everyone happy. Uh, so the one problem with trying to abolish it is that you need a constitutional uh amendment super majority to do it and you'd have a dozen states that are like wait a minute i'm less influential under you know the popular vote system because i'm nebraska i'm montana like you know like the electoral college helps me so so then you so you run into a very very practical problem where it's like i'll never get this changed because there are a lot of people that'll be shooting themselves in the foot um there, there's a there's a legitimate reason too which which is that Let's say we had popular vote and I was running for president, which I did. Thank you, everyone who supported me. I really appreciate it. Andrew Yang. Uh, then I would never leave a major media market. I would always be in a major media market because I just get more votes. Yeah. And then if I went if I went to some less populated area, it'd just be a waste of time. Um, now, right now, like the balance might be excessive in a particular direction, but you know, I don't. I'm not sure it'd be optimal for us just to be. Uh, campaigning on the coast or in the big cities. So the, the change that would that's practical and doable that most everyone should get behind that would also help ease this problem is you make it so that the Electoral College awards its votes not winner take all by state, but proportionally by state. So in other words, uh, if you know if, if California has 40 uh, electoral votes or more, then they get uh, awarded proportional to how men, how much I won that state by. So instead of getting all of them, I'd get 60% of them uh, or something along those lines. And if you did that, then all of a sudden the incentives for national candidates would be to campaign anywhere they can actually move the margin. Thank you for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, please do subscribe to Yang Speaks and click on notifications so we can let you know every time we have a new episode.